Charles F. Armstrong, New York Police Department, your host for this episode of Gangbusters. Our case is unusual because of the novel means by which we identified and found the criminals. In just a moment, I'll tell you more about it. Play an important part in our case, as you will see. A group of hold-up artists played cafes in Manhattan and the Bronx before branching out. And before their ultimate capture, made members of my department sore of foot and strained of eye from plotting and scanning the faint trail. Earliest complaints had the gang working cafes and bars in this style. Blonde Kathy Raywall and her boyfriend, Walter Morley, entertain a bartender, helping him kill a dull afternoon. Then he says, honey, the way you cook, even the garbage disposal gets ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 Did you hear the story about the elephant? Wait, 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 I got a hot one for you. I was going about this guy and his date, see? They kept coming into the same joint. Laughing it up. That isn't until they could size up the amount of business it was being done. <laughs> <laughs> then one afternoon, this guy reaches under his coat like this, see? And he pulls out a little old loaded automatic. <laughs> and he says to his buddy Barton, he says, Hey, we ain't joking anymore, buddy. Huh? That's right, no more long speeches. Just play along with the gag. Why? Stash that money in the bar towel. Come on, keep it happy, keep it happy. Keep it happy. In the purse. Thank you. Don't forget the bar, gorgeous. Just give us a few more minutes of your time, pal, and you'll be okay. Whatever you do, don't follow us. If there are any good jokes, I'll mail them to you. Give me the police. I want to report a hold up. Hurry. Did you see that? Oh. Uh, hello, Sergeant. I've been held up. They cleaned me out just a few minutes ago. Uh, oh, uh, I'm the bartender at the Cypress Room on 48th Street. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, she, she was a, a blonde, a young fella, a punk with a gun. Well, how, how should I know? They told me to stay still. I got kids, so I stayed still. No, no I, I didn't see a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I need a drink. A uh, hold up. You've been held up? I thought you were just telling jokes. Didn't you see it? The couple at the bar? They didn't even pay me for the drinks. I need a drink. Now, where did he go? Police heard the same story from victims many times, but before the pattern became too familiar, the gang switched operations to a new set of victims. It was a long tab they began building in their concentration on liquor stores. They held up more than 50 of them in Manhattan and the Bronx. We had descriptions of the gang members from victims, but they gave us nothing with which we could pin down their identities. We did know the girl lookout had blonde hair. The cars they used were abandoned. The police found out most of the cars were rented. That wasn't enough, for none of those items is uncommon in a large city. But then came the evening of February 16th in the Bronx. Hey, 
Don't forget, Kathy. Anybody spots us, lean on the horn. Sure, I know, but make it quick. Everything you got in that register, friend. And make it natural, really natural. No, I... Yes, and speedily. Say, so I'm next. Give me a bottle of Suchet. Give it to him. Waiting for someone, miss? Oh, no. check any tips on liquor store holdups. Radio cars in the area instantly converged on the store. But the gang had vanished again. There was only the ambulance and a man critically wounded in the line of duty. A blonde woman and three men the descriptions checked were those from other jobs. But now there was a new grim factor. A police officer had been shot. We had a pair of black horn-rimmed glasses for a doubtful clue. Sergeant, Sergeant Kelly's being signed to me. Will you take care of the paperwork? What's the word on Burke? Well, it's 50-50 now, the doc says. I've got the John Doe warrants made out for armed robbery, but if Burke doesn't make it, looks like we'll be adding a murder charge. He's got to make it. Uh, about 50 auto rental services in that area. Names and addresses are listed. Well, it's likely they rented a different car for each job, then abandoned it. Made it that much tougher to trace them. We'll have to check every rental agency. It'll be a weary job. You can only hope they made a mistake somewhere. Kelly. Yes? You'll change to civvies, of course, and you'll be in charge of checking the rentals, clear? Right, sir. Me, I'm going to see what a pair of glasses can tell us, if anything. There were no fingerprints. Maybe there's such a thing as eye prints. That means I'll have to see an expert. I contacted over 20 optometrists in Manhattan. Only a few of them agreed I had a chance. Good day. I'm Captain Armstrong, Dr. Amart. That's right. Glad to know you, Captain. Been expecting you with great interest since your phone call. Have a seat. Thanks. Doctor, I've got an urgent, healthy need in glasses. Probably want a pair of private eyeglasses, eh? Not even a pair of FBI glasses, Doc. Anyhow, I've got 20-20 vision. Well, you're fortunate, but what's the problem? Well, I'm looking for a dangerous man, and about the only clue I have are these glasses. Starting with the lenses and fitting the eyes to them. That's a provocative switch, and it's a possibility, although slight. However slight, I'm going to try with your help. The man who wore these glasses was in on the shooting of a fine officer. Well, I shall be proud to contribute what I can. Ascertaining the prescription for the lens is not a difficult procedure, if you know how. And, of course, the frame will tell something about the wearer. Yes? This style is definitely masculine. These are what are commonly referred to as horn rims. They are dark. 
And it's normal to suggest dark rims for persons with dark complexion and hair. Certainly not for blondes and gray-haired people. Well, this frame, I would say, indicates a conservative person, but not too conservative. It's a good, serviceable frame, but not on a style. Mm-hmm, just as I thought. These lenses are fairly new. There's an absence of scratches. And it's most likely that the wearer is under 45. They're not bifocals. If they were trifocals, he'd be over 55. Well, one thing is for certain, there weren't any fingerprints. That might indicate he was a neat person. But I imagine a casual observer wouldn't know this man without his glasses. They're sort of like a disguise dominating the face. Hmm. The man fitting these glasses had a broad face, perhaps fat. His nose also was broad at the bridge. High cheekbones or fat cheeks. And his head was long. Unless he had his ears on the back of his head. Great, great. I'm beginning to get the picture. Here, Captain, you can watch while I test for this prescription. We shall find out some more about our man. This is our silent detective. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Yeah. Yeah, but what is it? Very interesting. We're in luck. This is no ordinary prescription. This man's doctor will undoubtedly recall it. Good. What's so unusual about it? Here, you look. Be my guest. Captain, note the curve of the lens. Now, there's a job that takes delicate precision. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. But you better tell me, Doc. Well, as you can see, the patient had a slight astigmatism in both eyes, the right more than the left. Also, one eye was affected with a myopia, and the other with a hypermetropia. Not a common combination. All right, I'll write it out for you later. To the layman, he'd best be described as nearsighted in one and farsighted in the other. I imagine without his glasses, he doesn't know whether he's here or there. I'll write out this prescription for you. One of the first steps taken after the wealth of information from the doctor was the making of a sketch. In the first, the witnesses agreed that the face was too thin, the hairline wrong. We corrected the hairline, but in correcting the features, we made the face too fat. Witnesses now agreed that the features were very similar. The hairline was improved, but the suspect's hair was curly instead of straight. By now, a true composite was emerging. Curly hair, high cheekbones, broad, flat cheek planes, but the chin was too angular. The fifth and final was a masterpiece. Now we knew what our man looked like. Well, we've got a picture, all right. What we need is an identification. Any leads at all on that prescription? No, not yet. There's a long way to go, Captain. Opticians, oculus, optometrists, this town's loaded with them. And suppose this joker had his glasses made elsewhere. Oh, we can't even think of that. Any leads on the car rental agencies you haven't reported yet, Kelly? Now, the city's crawling with blondes who rent cars. Uh, we did think we had one good lead. Uh, this woman, a real looker, she rented cars on three different dates that coincided with the holdups. When I called on this lady, I, I found out her husband had forbid her to drive the family car after she had had a couple accidents and collected quite a few tickets. So she began renting them. Uh, the story's true, all right. I checked it out. Besides, her husband doesn't wear glasses. <laughs> Boy, was he mad. Well, that's a good try, Kelly. We're going to forget the car rental agencies for the time being and hit these glasses hard. We'll have copies made of the prescriptions. Divide up the list and go to work. Burke's going to make it all right. But only a heartbeat kept this from being murder. We're going to find the man who needs these glasses. Double checking our jigsawing of figures and descriptions, we showed the sketch to some of the victims.
Doctor, how can you be so sure you didn't fill this prescription without consulting your records? Such an unusual prescription that I'd never forget it. I see. Well, thank you, sir. All of the doctors questioned were sure they'd have remembered such a prescription had it been recent. It was discouraging, numbing. One optometrist taught me a trick that proved to be valuable in the eventual solution of the case. When you look at the wall chart, if your glasses are not a perfect prescription, you will instinctively clench your fist. If they are a perfect prescription, your hands will remain open, relaxed. I was to use this knowledge several times. First the cars, now the glasses. Where do we go from here, Captain? Ahead. We keep plugging. Captain, here's a Dr. Jensen to see you in an optician. Uh, optometrist, officer, optometrist. There, there's a difference. Send him right in. Come right in, doctor. Remember me, Captain? Well, certainly. You're only one of nine million optometrists in the city. That's right. The moment I'd rather not be. No? You see, I, uh, I didn't tell the truth when you asked my help yesterday. Withholding information from the police can be a pretty serious offense. I know all that. I was told yesterday. I was also told the owner of those glasses is a dangerous criminal. So I thought of my family, their welfare. I thought about it all last night. I couldn't sleep. I want to be a good citizen. And so you decided to come in of your own free will and... That's right. Will you keep my name out of it? Oh, certainly. Rest assured of that. Thanks. I made those lenses recently and put them into some old frames that the customer had. He, he gave his name as uh, Ronnie Byron. Here. Here's his address. Dr. Jertel's information pulled us from a dead end. We followed this lead to an apartment on 74th. Who is it? Telephone company, ma'am. Take it easy. Don't get nervous. The police, and we got warrants. Turn around. You Byron? No, he isn't. Let him do his own talking. Ah, uh, Morley. We'll see. Try these on for size. I don't need no extra eyes. I can tell you're a cop from a mile off on a foggy day. Yeah, I'll bet you could, but try them on anyway. Walk over there. Read to me. Copper, I can't even see the magazine with these things. You're not the one. Give them back. What, are you a magician or something? One look and you know, huh? Yeah, one look. It's your ham. What's in there? Bedroom. Let's go. Sit down.
Officer Burke's service revolver. Well, now, shall we start at the beginning? So, Kathy told you the truth, Captain. That's the way we operated. It was Ted Nebo who left the hardware here. I won't touch the stuff myself. That's his department. He and four-eyed Byron lived here. They're out in West 29th now. I'm remembering the number. Of all the millions of persons who need and wear glasses, the search was narrowed down to one. A pair of lost spectacles was going back to roost on the right face. That's you, Ted? Yeah. Come on in. Hope you got some new specs for me to try. This thing's a nuisance. Ah, oh, nice. Ah, yeah, fine. Where'd you find them? In the alley behind the liquor store. These aren't mine. Kathy and Morley have gossip, Byron. Do you want to start now? You got nothing on me, copper. Just being helpful, returning your glasses, that's all. Stand up. There now, Byron. Isn't that better? These aren't mine. Quit wearing cheetahs a year ago. They're a nuisance. Yeah, we know. And besides, they spoil your good looks. This gadget's much handier. Come off it, Byron. We got you cold. Now, where's your evidence? Down at headquarters. And it's a lucky thing for you that those were copies, because where you're going, reading is one of the few recreations. Ten minutes later, we captured Ted Nebo, the fourth member of the gang, and ended the crime wave by looking through a criminal's pair of eyeglasses. Eyeglasses can tell us almost as much as fingerprints. Byron and Morley were given sentences of 15 to 20 years each. Ted Nebo was handed a sentence of five to ten years. Kathy Raywall was sent to Bedford Reformatory for two and a half years. Attention, attention to all citizens and police. Wanted and still at large, Max Heimowitz fled from the state of Pennsylvania to escape prosecution for murder. Max Heimowitz, age 36, Height, five foot six inches. Weight, 170 pounds. Occasionally wears mustache. Two inch scar over left eyebrow, repeating. Two inch scar over left eyebrow. Dagger tattooed on left thigh. Previously convicted for extortion and carrying concealed weapons. FBI Identification Order 2442 states, Max Heimowitz may be armed and should be considered dangerous. Gangbusters, created by Phillips H. Lord. you have heard tonight was based upon police records, court records, and personal interviews.